please stand. We'll begin with a word of prayer. Glad you're here this morning. God in heaven, you're great, you're wonderful, you're kind, you're unchanging. Father, uh, nothing compares to you. You're above all. Pray today that you will be praised as your people have gathered. And Father, may we be impacted by what the scriptures teach. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, and I'd like to welcome all of those of you that are watching this on social media. Blessed 
you're here today. John Payton was a uh, translator of the Bible for a South Sea tribe and as he was translating the Bible into their language he realized he came to the word faith or trust and realized that the people didn't have a word for faith or trust in their own language. So he was trying to figure out how exactly he would explain that because, see, that's a major part of being a Christian is faith or trust in God or in Christ, whatever it might be. So he thought about it, and finally, uh, one of the local tribesmen come running into his home. He flopped down in a chair. He was out of breath, and he made this statement. He said, it is good to put all my weight on this chair. That's when John Patton went, that's it. That's the word I need. That's the word for faith or trust. Because if you look at the basic ba uh, biblical definition of faith, it is to put, to put one's complete or trust or all their weight on God or on Christ particularly. And so as we look at that this morning, let's turn over to the Gospel of John chapter 20, if you would. John chapter 20. We're going to look at Thomas this morning. John chapter 20. And this is, uh, in this section of Scripture, time frame-wise, is after the resurrection of Jesus, okay? So it's during that time frame. I wanted you to get a picture of what we're talking about. The Gospel of John, chapter 20, starting there at verse 19. Let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, how good it is to call you Messiah and King and say that we trust on you in the good days and the days that are not so good. I pray, Father, as we look at Thomas and his life, that we might understand more about our own faith and understand a little bit about the example that Thomas set and the other set and the other apostles as well. Thank you, Lord, for those that have gathered, those that are watching. In Jesus' name, amen. John 20, starting at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews... Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. With that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas called Didymus, which means the twin, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where his nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. 
Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet, not, yet have believed. Today we're going to be looking at Thomas, a man that has gone down in history with the famous reputation of being who? Doubting Thomas. How would you like to have that name given to you? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Recorded for, for thousands of years, Doubting Thomas. Wouldn't that be just wonderful? I thought about that before, and boy, that, that, that seems like a rough way to go. Uh, where did he exactly get that name? It doesn't really come out in Scripture, except for this particular episode, this event out of the pages of Scripture. Back in the 6th century, there was some uh, artwork that was, uh, that was displayed or produced. And one of the titles that was given to a portrait or a picture of Thomas was the incredulity of Thomas. Now that's a word I've never used before in my life and probably will never use again. But that word translated or understood is the doubting of Thomas, 6th century A.D. So it may have been even before that, but whatever it might be, you have that. But if you look at the apostles, you have a man by the name of Simon, and Jesus calls him Peter the Rock. Now that's a good name. That's a solid name. It's a foundation. Or we looked at James and John, I think it was last week. Boanerges, sons of thunder. Boy, that's a good name, isn't it? That's something I'd want to be called in the pages of history. Then you have, recorded in Scripture, you have Judas Iscariot, don't we? The traitor. A name well-deserved, a title well-deserved, because that's exactly what he did to Jesus. But doubting Thomas, is that fair? Is it really understandable when we look at this character? And if you're visiting with us today, it's your first day with us, or maybe first, back, first day back, we've been walking through a series on the Apostles. And it's been an encouragement to me to look at their lives and see how they lived. And, and we have some information recorded about some of the apostles and some we don't. Thomas we have a little bit more about than some of the other apostles. But as we look at Doubting Thomas, is that a title that's well deserved? I don't think so, not really. One writer said it this way, and I like how he wrote it. In the end, the nickname Doubting Thomas is rather an unfortunate one. It's true that Thomas demanded evidence of the miracle of Christ's resurrection before he accepted the truth. Doubt factored into his response to his friends, but it was not the defining quality of his life. Thomas should be better known for his loyalty, his obedience to the gospel, and his faith. And I think that to be true because it seems that proved out through other events that we have recorded in Scripture. But there's also extra biblical sources that tell us a little bit about the life of Thomas after he left that area. Thomas is said to have gone to what is India today and became a missionary there and actually died in service to Christ there. And, and you can go today and find where his tomb is. And there's a dedicated tomb to him in saying that he served Christ faithfully for the days of his life. So that might be a better way to remember this man, Thomas. But as we look at that, understand, Thomas wasn't the only one who had doubts about the resurrection of Jesus. The other apostles doubted as well. Over in the Gospel of Luke at chapter 24, towards the end of Jesus' life and, and during the resurrection or after the resurrection that morning, when the ladies went to the tomb, it says in there, Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other woman with them, who told these things to the apostles. They had seen the resurrected Christ. They told them to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. And they did not believe them. The ladies came and said, hey, we've seen Jesus. And the apostles said, no, you haven't. So there's doubt in their mind. Continuing out of the Gospel of Luke chapter 24. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet? 
that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for the Spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. So Thomas wasn't the only one who doubted. A matter of fact, as you read through the Gospel of Luke chapter 24, you get the impression all of them doubted at some point. I mean, these women that were dedicated to the Lord saw his resurrection and they talked with him and they went and told him and they still doubted their word. So if all of Jesus' disciples doubted his bodily resurrection, why is Thomas given the reputation of being doubting Thomas? One reason, I believe, was with the vehemence, the, the, the deep sincerity, the passion. I won't believe until I touch the nail-scarred hands and reach my hands into his side. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever said something that is rather rash or rather quick that you regret saying? I know I have. Maybe the passion gets a hold of you or, or, or you speak out of turn or you're trying to impress somebody or whatever it is, but you all of a sudden just speak without thinking. I think that's what's going on in the life of Thomas. He was serious, just like the other apostles were. But man, his life had just changed in an instant. Here was the Messiah, the king of the nation, destroyed and killed. And to talk about his resurrection, that's unheard of. People don't resurrect. People don't come back from the dead. But that's what's going on in the life. But hear me on this. This is important to understand. Jesus forewarned the apostles this was all coming. He didn't leave them this, this fact unknown to them. There's a couple of places in the Scripture. Matthew chapter 16. Now Matthew chapter 16, most of you know that, is where Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, well, that wasn't revealed to you by man, but by God. That's what Peter said. In that section of Scripture, Jesus talked about that, but he said, listen to this, this is important. From that time on, Jesus began to explain his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. That's what Jesus said himself. I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be crucified, and I'm going to rise from the grave. He told the disciples ahead of time. But did you notice the very beginning part of that? It says, from that time on. It wasn't the first time and it wasn't the last time he would tell them. He was continuing to get them to understand that this was coming. Mark chapter 9, verses 31 and 32. He was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man, that's Jesus' title that he gave himself, that he carried. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. Another instance. Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34. And the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. And everything that is written about the Son of Man and the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles. He will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. Time and time and time again, he tried to get them to get the idea of what was going to happen. But that's not what they thought. That's not what their vision was. And they missed it. But Jesus wanted them to understand it. As a matter of fact, over in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16, after Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise from the third day. Guess what Peter did? It says he took Jesus to the side and he rebuked Jesus. Can you imagine rebuking Jesus? He did. No, it ain't going to happen that way. We'll stop it. We'll do whatever we have to, Jesus. But that's what Peter did. And not only that, but as you look at those things, the events out of Mark chapter 9, which I read for you in Luke chapter 18, following those words, it says, but they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. They didn't understand what was going on. They've heard it, but they weren't willing to put it all together. Now, I, I don't know if it was the death, if it was the burial, or the resurrection they were having a hard time getting a hold of because it didn't seem that the death part was such a hard aspect to grab a hold of. 
Over in, the, uh, over in the Gospel of John chapter 11, Lazarus is nearing death and he eventually dies and Jesus goes and he resurrects Lazarus from the dead. And all those things are taking place and the apostles kind of warned him and said, Jesus, you really shouldn't head towards Jerusalem. Bethany was not very far from Jerusalem. Your enemies are there. They're going to try to uh, kill you or get rid of you or whatever it might be. And listen, that doubting Thomas that we're talking about this morning, listen to the words that he had to say. This is great. Let us also go that we may die with him. Is that not a man of faith? Is that not a fellow that believed in the cause? That was Thomas. You know what, Jesus, if you say we're going to Jerusalem and and whatever happens, I'm with you. I'm right there by your side. And that's exactly the guy we're talking about. Now why may have Thomas been dubbed Doubting Thomas? Look back with me to John chapter 20, 24 through 28. I want to reread that section of Scripture. John chapter 20, 24 through 28. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where his nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hands, and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said, My Lord and my God. Maybe he just couldn't accept what was going on. Maybe it was just overwhelming to think about any of those things taking place. And I don't know, but... but As I told you before, when I read the Bible, I try to picture the scene. I wonder if if, if he was on his knees when he realized that was going on. And he just looked up, he said, my Lord and my God. Because the realization that Jesus had resurrected from the grave was apparent. It wasn't to be missed. It wasn't to be misunderstood. They got the point. And no longer was he doubting Thomas, but he was a man of faith. You and I live in a world that people have doubts. And understandably so. And there's a lot of reasons that people doubt. And maybe you've even dealt with doubt before in your life. Sometimes people want to justify the way they're living based on what Scripture teaches Here's what I mean is if we're living against what the Scriptures teach and we're a follower of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit works on us and it convicts us. And and we may say, well, I'm not going to read that for an hour. I'm not going to pray about these things. I'm not going to seek God. I'm not going to go to church. And we turn our back on those things. What we're doing is we're trying to justify the things that we're doing as being right. That can be a reason for doubt. There was a fellow I knew that was living openly against God. He knew he was. He was a Christian. He was a follower of Christ. But he chose instead to go against the teachings of the Bible. We had a conversation about those things. And he decided that he would walk away from Jesus. That was his decision. Because what did he choose? He chose his lifestyle over what the Scriptures taught. Now we have whole uh, churches that they call themselves churches today. They're doing the exact same thing. And we can't do that. If the scriptures teach it, we need to live it. It's just that simple. I saw a great quote from Francis Chan, a great preacher. He said, if I read something in the Bible and it's not what the scriptures teach, then I'm the one that's wrong. If I feel something and it goes against what scripture teaches, then I'm the one that's wrong, not God. But oftentimes we turn our back on God and doubt because we want to do what we want to do when we want to do it, don't we? instead of being faithful and true. That's one reason we doubt, is because we openly want to live our own way. Others refuse to believe because they trust God more than they do something else. Science is a powerful, powerful thing. And sometimes we want to believe science over what God says. 
I know there's a lot of different theologians that I read. Some of them write really well, really great stuff. But some of them doubt the miracles that take place in Scripture because they go against the physics that we understand a part of the, the nature that we live in, the, the world that we live in, and it goes against. But if you look at every single miracle Jesus performed, it goes against everything that's normal, doesn't it? Blind people don't all of a sudden start seeing. The lame just don't suddenly start walking. The dead certainly don't rise from the grave. That isn't normal. So every single miracle that you read about in Scripture goes against science. It's not supposed to happen that way. Things don't get better, they get worse. And then, sometimes we doubt, not only because of we want to justify our lifestyle or we want to put something else above God. Another reason is we want to put God in the box that he fits in in our mind. We have this nice little box. God fits into it in our world. Sometimes, y'all remember that little song that we used to sing? I can't remember how the words were. We take our Jesus out and... And put them back in. Y'all remember that song? Does anybody know what's that song? Yeah, if I had a little white box, yeah, yeah, I'd put, yeah, yeah, I put my Jesus in. Man, that's bad theology. <laughs> you can't put Jesus in a little white box. But, but think about it. I got lost my train of thought. <laughs> we take God... And we put him in a box. And, and as long as God fits in that box in our world, it's fine. But once he blows that box apart, oh, that can't be part of God. That can't be part of his spirit. Church, we can't stop God, and he's beyond anything that we could imagine. God doesn't fit in the box that we make for him. He never has. He never will. When we get to heaven, our mind is going to be blown. We're working through a Bible study on Wednesday mornings, and we're talking about the nature of God. And I told the class ahead of time, I said, this isn't light stuff, and it's not. But I can tell you out of studying about the nature of God, I've gained a greater appreciation for who God is and what he can do, way beyond what I ever thought. But see, sometimes we doubt because God doesn't fit in the box you and I created. We've got to be careful. Now, I want to conclude with this. If Thomas, who had experienced three and a half years of ministry of Jesus, had experienced his death, the Last Supper, and all those things, and came at a critical point of life and had doubt, then I can, I can assume that I will also have doubt in my life at times. I've expressed this to you before. Sometimes I do doubt and I have to wrestle through that for myself. I don't know if you're like that, but I am. Back several months ago, my mother-in-law had open heart surgery back in June. My brother-in-law had come down from Columbus to visit with her for a few moments. My brother-in-law, even though I, I, I will deny that I said this about him, he's a good man. He really is. He's an elder at the Heath Church of Christ and has been for the last several years. He's been very faithful to the Lord for as long as I've known him. A really good man. Several years ago, his father passed away of cancer kind of rather quickly. And then, within a short time, he lost his younger sister to cancer as well. We were walking out of the hospital and we were talking about life and everything. And I just looked at him. He said, I told him, I said, sometimes I wrestle with my faith. Sometimes I have doubt. And he said, I do too. Sometimes when we walk in life, we have things that cause us doubt. And we have to walk through that time. Now, as I say all that, please don't misunderstand me that I don't doubt God exists. I believe he exists. I don't doubt the resurrection of Christ. I believe firmly in those things. But oftentimes at the end of the day, when I wrestle through that doubt, I come to the conclusion, just like Peter did, my Lord and my God. Because you see, if I look at anything else in life, what am I going to rest upon? I certainly cannot rest upon the good nature of me. I know how I am. I can't justify my lifestyle. 
because I know how weak and frail and how miserable a person I am. I certainly cannot count on something above God like science or family or anything or even culture like we're getting better in our culture. I can count on the kindness of humanity. Is that a joke? The kindness of humanity. Yeah, there's some people out there that are kind, but most are not. Or I might even try to put God in a box and rest on those things. Some of my favorite words in all the Bible come out of John chapter 6. Towards the end of that chapter, about verse 56. Jesus is teaching about how his disciples have to consume the blood and the body of Christ. And it said many disciples walked away. And he looked at the apostles and he said, how about you? Are you going to walk away too? And one of my favorite words Peter ever said, where can we go? You have the words of life. That's some of the most powerful thing. And that's what I come to at the end of the day. When I wrestle through that doubt, I come back to the very fact Jesus has the words of life. And that's the only things I can count on. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we could gather in your holy and righteous name. You are the only God there is. You give us life and meaning and purpose. And we praise you. Father, there's so many wonderful blessings in life and there's so much heartache at times. But help us come back to you every single time and say, my Lord and my God, there is none but you. I pray, Father, as we move into a time of decision that you'll bless it. If there's somebody here, Father, that doesn't follow you, may you give them the strength to step out. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me this morning, please? If you're here and you're in Christ, praise God. If you're having times of doubt... I understand. Stay faithful. If you're not in Christ, now is the time to come forward. Make your decision known. Be baptized into his name so that he might become a part of your life to wash away your sin and add you to his body. Let's sing together.
Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible says this, or chapter 13, the Bible says this. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. This ritual that Hebrews 13 describes was first uh, given in Leviticus chapter 4. Whatever sin was the, the person was guilty of, that person had to lay his hands on the head of an animal and it was slain. And this act symbolized that the sin and guilt was being transferred to the animal. The animal was then bearing the sin of the guilty person. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, the Bible says this, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. The implication is very clear. The body of Christ bore our sin. On the body of Christ, condemnation fell. And it was not for his own sins, but ours. It was the condemnation which we, not he, de deserved. And so at this time, we all pause, look in the mirror, and what do we see? If you're like me, when I look in the mirror, I see myself for who I am. I see my flaws and my sin, and I see a lot needs to be improved in order for me to be like Christ. But then, when I remember at this time that when I see that in the mirror, I know that Jesus Christ the Lord took my sin upon himself, and now I am set free. And so this time when we think about, reflect upon, and remember that Jesus bore our sin there upon the cr cross. We take this bread and drink this cup to remember his body and his blood. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we praise your holy name. You are indeed a God of compassion. You are a God of love, mercy, and grace. And we thank you so much for sending your one and only son and we thank you that we can remember him together as a church and what he did for us in bearing our sins upon the cross. And we thank you, Father, for the mercy and grace that we have received through Jesus Christ, the Lord. And it's through him we pray. Amen.
just a couple of mentions to you. Uh, we have our picnic today. If you didn't sign up for it, come anyway. We're going to have a good time. We'll have it out here in the garage. Uh, we're going to have all kinds of good things. I know you are excited about s'mores on an 85 degree day. Uh, I am. But uh, we also have a new ice shave machine. We're going to have that for the kids and the adults if you want to do that. So I'll keep you a little bit cooler. But we'll have that out there with all kinds of games and a lot of fun stuff. So don't forget that. That's today from 4 to 6. Also, the reason I had you stay seated Raise your hand if you have ever attended Sunday school. Just raise your hand for a minute. Raise your hand if you've ever attended Sunday school in your life. Now stop around, keep your hand up, but look around. Look around for a minute. A lot of you haven't. Now here's my question to you. If you're not attending Sunday school, why not? We have some of the best teachers. Sunday school teachers, stand up for just a moment. Stand up for a minute. Okay, Ken, stand up. Angie, Rhonda, you're up there. Oh, there's Rhonda. Okay, is Miss Tommy in here? Miss Tommy? Is Jan is not here today. Okay, y'all can sit back down. Thank you. These are some of the most prepared people you will ever meet in your life. Whether you believe it or not, every single week they come in prepared to teach. And in addition to that, we have that from little babies all the way up to not little babies. Okay? So I invite you, next Sunday, most classes, can you start at 930? Is that right? 930? You start at 945, right? Okay, most of our Sunday school classes, Ken starts at 9.30, most of the others start at about 9.45. TJ, he's not in here, he's in the back. TJ, he's already doing a chosen series for our younger adults. So I invite you, next week is back to the basics Sunday school. Be here at 9.45. Give it a week or two, see what you think of it. Don't forget that, okay? Just a quick mention of that. Okay, uh, now you can stand up. Okay? Also, tonight at 6.30, following the picnic, our children will be in here. Last week, Taylor had 15 children getting prepared for the Christmas program. Uh, TJ had nine middle schoolers and high schoolers upstairs in the loft, which is great. So all those things are going on today. Four to six, the picnic, 6.30 in here. So don't forget those kind of things. To, uh, let's see. I think that's the only thing I want to mention. Other than, remember Lonnie McComas. He was taken to the hospital. I know that he would appreciate your prayers, him and Susie, very, very much. Uh, so we need to remember them in our prayers. Anything else from the elders need to be mentioned okay thank you very much next Sunday evening we'll start back our p.m. service so it'll start at 7 p.m. I'll be over in the chapel and Jim will be teaching for that so that's always a good time let's pray before we go Heavenly Father I thank you for all the activities may you bless us as we depart be with us later today as we enjoy the day and then this coming week pray that you be with Lonnie and Susie and their family father with all that's going on for them give them strength and guidance in Jesus name Amen.